Van Gogh's 1889 painting, Starry Night, hangs in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. I'm betting you recognize it. We're going to do a compositional analysis of it so that you can understand a little better how your eyes make sense of the things they see. Not just art, but all sorts of things that you see. And you should know that great artists and designers become adept at fine-tuning the things they make to affect viewers in a variety of ways. They do this when they construct buildings, products, advertisements, movies, you name it. The visual elements are the ingredients of a work of art. Line, shape, color, texture, depth, form. The principles of design, which we are going to look at in this video, are the possible arrangements of those visual elements and the effects those arrangements have on us. Keep in mind that since these are principles that we are talking about, they carry over extremely well from how we see to other domains such as music, writing, language learning, joke telling, politics, parenting, you name it. You can apply this in many ways. Here are two different images of cypress tree landscapes. How the artists have arranged the visual elements in their respective compositions will cause you to barely glance at one image and yet gaze at length at the other. One image seems stark, one less so. One image will cause your eye to move at jerking angles, and the other will pull your eye in undulating arcs. One image will cause your body to tense, and the other image will excite your soul. Let's take a moment to examine how Van Gogh has dialed in the principles of design to make this an intriguing and memorable painting. Before we get into an analysis of this painting, though, let's first let our eyes soak it up. If you were standing in front of this painting at, at MoMA in New York, you would notice the thickness of the paint, the texture of the canvas, even the abruptness of some of the stilted, chunky lines. Colors that you would at first name as black actually start to appear dark green or blue as you stare at them longer. Remember, sight is not immediate. Let your eyes absorb the colors, the lines, the shapes, the proportions of things. Wow, this is quite an orchestration, a visual feast. Okay, let's see what's going on here, how parts relate to each other and how we respond to such relationship arrangements, the principles of design. Here's a phrase useful to remind us about how our eyes work. Dominance of majority, emphasis of minority. What this means is that our eyes take for granted the things that we see everywhere, and we find of special interest the stuff that we see the least of. Think of the last time you went somewhere where everyone was dressed formally and one chap didn't get the memo and wore shorts and sandals. You couldn't help but notice him. He not only felt odd, but probably plenty of people took unintentional sideways glances at him, even repeatedly. Van Gogh lets rippling, curving lines dominate the scene. Darkness dominates. Hills and houses happen everywhere. You take these things for granted because they happen everywhere. The sky carries on the same visual sensibility. What kind of sky would fit above a linear and chunky landscape? How about a linear and chunky sky? Ripples in the sky give it a visual similarity to the land. That becomes the voice or the visual language in this painting. Undulating curves and ripples happen everywhere so that you take them for granted. The same kinds of lines repeat all over. Similar colors repeat, similar shapes repeat, similar texture repeats. Van Gogh lets you learn his language the same way that you would learn any language, by immersion. Repetition enhances understanding. If you encounter any language often enough, repeated, you'll begin to comprehend it, whether it be linguistic, musical, mathematical, or visual. A composition has unity when there is a sense of oneness or wholeness to it. Van Gogh creates unity here by keeping brushstrokes similar. 
shapes reminiscent of each other and like colors appearing in many different parts of the painting. Look at how many places blue appears. Sky, land, houses, and yellow appears in the sky and even down in the windows of the houses. So Van Gogh creates a great sense of unity, but without making a single aspect uniform. Uniformity would be mechanical, expectable, and for his purposes, boring. Instead, Van Gogh creates areas of difference. Greater difference equals greater contrast. Some of these items I have numbered here contrast a lot. The more a variant contrasts, the greater its visual hierarchy. I have numbered the moon here one, so you can track how I am seeing the hierarchy playing out. Two is also a major variant. Three, less so, and four, even less. Variety enhances interest. You know, variety is the spice of life. Remember that phrase, dominance of majority, emphasis of minority? When there's less of something, your eye finds it because there's less of it, and it's different. There are plenty of stars, so your eye goes to the moon. There's only one moon. It's small, warm-colored, and a distinct shape. For all these reasons, it contrasts with the stars. In a composition, we call the area with the most contrast the focal point. It's the place that calls most strongly for our eye's attention. In a sense, it's in charge. It's the heavy. It carries the most visual weight. If the stars are congressmen and women, the moon is the president. Other variants in the composition carries visual weight as well. Number two especially, but also three and four. But nothing contends with a strong focal point like this one. Another way you could refer to the lower visual hierarchy is with the term counterpoint. If the focal point is the plot, these work as subplot. Now, how can Van Gogh get away with dropping such an anomaly as this moon into the composition? What makes a focal point not stand out like a sore thumb or a, like an elephant in the room that's just obnoxious? The answer, my dear friend, is harmony. Our third principle of design. Harmony enhances belonging amongst difference. If the moon by itself stands out like a sore thumb, Van Gogh gives the focal point friends, 11 other glowing orbs and six more house lights that hearken back to that focal point variant with the moon so it doesn't look like it stands out alone. Additionally, he lets countless other shapes curve with the same kind of curve of the moon. And the points of the crescent moon, those pokey protrusions, they appear in that other major anomaly, the spiring tree. Just for fun, let's see how our number two variant, the tree, the counterpoint, gets harmonized with the composition. Oh, the steeple of the church is much like it, but part of the landscape. So the landscape is being made to look partly like the variant. That's the other way this can go. And there are other squattier triangles. And of course, its colors appear elsewhere. The, the greens and the brownish reds integrated into the composition. And what about balance? This is our fourth principle of design. Too much balance without complexity is boring. Too little balance, even with simplicity, is stressful. Symmetry can be pretty intriguing when the image is complex like this one. It has connotations of holiness and perfection. One problem with symmetry, though, is that once your eye has seen one side, your peripheral vision tells you that you don't much need to see the other side. The balance is necessarily straightforward in symmetry, and your eye gets done figuring it out so much sooner. But oh, the loveliness of asymmetric balance. So in asymmetric balance, we have balance, but is not readily perceived. How balance is achieved is much more complex. Let's examine how Van Gogh balances this image. I've drawn a triangle in the center bottom of the composition. Let's think about it as a fulcrum. 
it's incredibly helpful to think about visual balance the same way that you might be thinking of balancing on a teeter-totter. Do you have experience with that? And why did I put the fulcrum here? A gap or difference establishes a fulcrum. It naturally resides in the middle. The fulcrum is normally in the middle unless there's a reason to see it elsewhere. So we have nine glowing orbs to the left of center and three to the right. Numerically, the left side should be weightier, but remember the moon is the focal point, visual hierarchy number one, the most weighty thing in the composition by far. So Van Gogh throws the spiring tree to the left side of the composition to help the nine stars counterbalance the moon and its two stars. Counterpoint three and four don't mu do much in this diagram. They are near the fulcrum of the teeter-totter, and even the biggest kid in the playground can't affect much change when standing in the middle of the teeter-totter. Sometimes it's easier to think of things in terms of cats and diamonds. See how the cats need lots of companions stacked up mostly on the left to neutralize a heavy diamond so close to the end of the teeter-totter on the right? But there's one more way to think about how this image is balanced asymmetrically. This painting could be diagrammed to balance this way as well because now every variant is to the left of the divide countering the weight of the focal point. In Cats and Diamonds, it would more, look more like this. Yeah, that is a really heavy diamond, but a strong focal point so close to the edge can require a lot to counter counterbalance it. Van Gogh's aware of this and he does it successfully even. In either case, it's balanced and you can sense the balance, the equaling weight of the sides. And that non-obvious balance, asymmetric balance, allows the painting to hold your attention. See how imbalanced it is if we mute the moon? Everything weights to the left. And now we come to the principle of proportion. Proportion can be a size or numeric relationship of parts to a whole or parts to parts. Oh look, I've evened out the proportion of stars to moons. And in terms of dominance of majority, emphasis of minority, the painting just got way less interesting. I can change the height to width proportion. And again, hmm. and for the term scale, it often refers to the actual overall size of an artifact or subject or the size compared to the viewer or the original. So uh, look, I've changed the scale. A painting this small seems so tiny and precise, but now I'm showing you the scaled model of it, how big the original painting would appear compared to me, a six foot tall person standing in the museum. The principle of movement refers to how your eye travels over a composition. It's gravitated towards the variance of the composition, but following the major implied or explicit lines. Generally, your eye looks first at the focal point and finds the most accessible nearby variant. Mm -hmm. Ooh, look at this. Uh -huh. Ooh. And back to home plate. If you were to draw it out with arrows, it might look something like this. And our last principle of design rhythm is a lot like rhythm in music. What's interesting isn't a regular beat, dot, 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 but cadence that you pick up as your eye moves over the composition, bump, t -t -t bump, bump, t -t -t bump, something like that. Rhythm is the combination of repetition, which is regularly occurring elements, like the striped hills, trees, and some of the evenly spaced stars. Variation, some of the less evenly spaced stars, uh, the visual hierarchy that we noted, the different counterpoints. These are elements that contrast. And movement, that's the path that our eye follows that will dictate what order we see things in. So your eye moves quickly over large, simple things and slowly over small and complex things. It's easy to figure out the simple and large ones. So I'll start here and then oh, over here and then off to here and then oh, we see these things and then our eye moves down. Oh, look at that. Oh, over there and this and on back to 
the focal point. So this is a crude and slow approximation of the pace and direction your eye might likely travel across the image, but hopefully it helps much more naturally. Your eye jitters as it looks around things, but it does tend to follow the pads and we don't look um, across lines. We look along with them in almost every case. And that wraps it up. I hope this analysis has been helpful for you in discerning how the principles of design are at work in this painting. So that hopefully you can be more aware of how they're at work in so many other things you encounter in your life. Your life. Your life. Not mine. Your life.